Hi, everyone. It's so great to have you all here. Um, I just want to introduce our panelists to the audience. Um, and then we'll, we'll start talking. Um, we're here today to, to talk about Kashmir, discourses on Kashmir and, you know, settler colonialism, and, but also the, the, very, the history and the present moment um, concerning the struggle for Azadi in Kashmir. So Athar Zia, I will introduce first. So Athar Zia is a political anthropologist, poet, short fiction writer, and a columnist. She te teaches at University of North Ca North Northern Colorado, Greeley. She is the author of Resisting Disappearances, Military Occupation, and Women's Activism in Kashmir the co-editor of Can You Hear Kashmiri Women Speak, Resisting Occupation in Kashmir, and A Desolation Called Peace. She has published a poetry collection, The Frame, and another collection is forthcoming, Athar's ethnographic poetry on Kashmir. And I find ethnographic poetry just ultimately incredibly cool, um, but also very, very necessary. Um, her ethnographic poetry has won an award from the Society of Humanistic Anthropology. She is the founder editor of Kashmir Lit and of the Critical Kashmir Studies Collective and an interdisciplinary network of scholars working on the Kashmir region. I think it's so lovely to have you here. Thank you. Um, Hilal Mir is a freelance Srinagar based journalist. He has previously reported for Greater Kashmir, Hindustan Times, and Kashmir Reader. And I've been in touch with both Hilal and Athar before, but um, with Athar in particular to try to really understand the journalism that is that is missed. So I'm really happy that we have him here to talk about, um, you know, the state and of journalism and depictions of Kashmir. Um, Omar Dar's paternal family was ethnically cleansed from um, Srinagar, Srinagar Kashmir in 1948 for demanding plebiscites under the UN resolutions. Her maternal family, exiled from Kashmir after accepting Islam during the Dogra regime, fought for independence from the British, and her granduncle, Dr. Saifuddin Kichliu, was widely known as the hero, hero of the Jallianwala Bagh. With a background in inter interdisciplinary studies, uh, that lectures in the Departments of Gender and Women's Studies and Ethnic Studies at University of California at Berkeley and the Department of Critical Studies and Philosophy at California College of the Arts. Her work is focused on the intersections and co-formations of race, religion, caste, class, caste, class, gender, sexuality, and national politics of South Asia and South Asian diasporas centered in intellectual and political activism for social justice, especially in Indian occupied Kashmir. Her published work includes cinematic strategies for pornotropic Kashmir and some counter archives in the Journal of Contemporary Theory and pieces in several edited volumes focused on South Asia. She is a feature editor at Pulse Media, a collaborative political activist and academic weblog, and is a published poet. She is a founding member of the Working Group on Muslim Identities and Cultures and organized the feminist conference Boundaries in Question on the theme of women in war, both at UC Berkeley. So it is so lovely to have you all here. I, I just want to give a very, very brief introduction. And I think that, you know, the way I phrase it, um, given that I'm not Kashmiri, may well be in under question, but just a very brief introduction for our audience to, you know, place them in the, in the introduction. Um, Kashmir is a territory that has been claimed by both India and Pakistan since 1947 has a long history of separatist movements and independence in Azadi that really predates 1947. Since 1947, India and Pakistan have fought two wars over the region and they've come perilously close at several other occasions and they failed to reach a peace agreement. The UN called in 1948 for a plebiscite calling Kashmiris to determine their own fate where it has never been held. In August of 2019, um, tens of thousands of additional Indian troops were deployed in, in addition to the ones that are already deployed um, in Jammu and Kashmir. Um, schools and colleges were shut. Polit regional political leaders were placed under house arrest. But Article 35, 35A of the Indian Constitution, which gave special, special privileges to people of the state, um, was partly scrapped, the government then revoked nearly all of Article 370 
um, which 35A is part of. And since then, um, a lot of things have been very difficult and it is arguable, I think we'll talk about this as to how new these difficulties are and how new um, everything is under the Modi regime and how much of it's a, it's a continuation of. Um, just on October 15th, this, this past October 15th, leaders of the major pro-India parties, many of the leaders of whom were under house arrest, announced a People's Alliance for um, the, a, a, an, an, an alliance under which they would come together. Um, so my first question to all of you is a very broad question as to where we are now, now that these political leaders have declared an alliance. And I think it's not just about this alliance that pro-India parties have declared, but also it's about how the story is being told, how Kashmir, Kashmiri media, how Kashmir is depicted in the media and what stories are never told and especially now, but also historically. So I think, Hilal, it would be great to start with you, especially, you know, as a journalist, what you, you feel about this? Broadly, I think nothing uh, matters. The, like these pro-India parties, they have come together and formed an alliance and now renamed it as People's Alliance for Gupkar De Declaration, which the name itself is absurd. Uh, I think what is uh, worrying is is the pace at which the uh, the dismantling of Kashmiri um, the the structures which existed mm -hmm. before and uh, and how everything is geared up uh, for the settler colonialism the changes which are being and also the disposition and disempowerment of Kashmiri Muslims, uh, not uh, only ethnic Kashmiri Muslims, but Muslims of the erstwhile Jammu and Kashmir in general. So um, in that context, this, uh, the, de this declaration mean, don't mean anything. For example, uh, um, day after they announced this uh, alliance, formation of a new alliance, uh, the government of India announced formation of these block development councils, which effectively renders any kind of uh, politics uh, ineffective. Even if, um, say, assembly elections are held, and uh, so uh, I think this, and and also the pace at which these changes are being made, like we can't even keep. Um, pace with these um, changes. Mm, uh, like people are still uh, grappling with uh, like how the domicile law is uh, being enforced. Say, for example, right now the demographic change is not happening. Like the way the people, uh, especially the Muslims, fear it. Mm, we don't see Indian settling in right now. Like. Uh, what we are seeing right now is the ground is being prepared for what people eventually fear will be the flooding of uh, um, ethnic flooding of uh, especially the Muslim dominated areas of Kashmir. And at the same time, every like institution is being uh, uh, you can say cleansed of uh, the Muslims. Let's uh, many stories you might have read uh, recently in Al Jazeera and other uh, uh, media outlets. How there is not a single Muslim uh, in the uh, the current Lieutenant Governor's Secretariat. So not even like not even say uh, leave apart um, uh, leave aside these uh, Kashmiri Muslims, but not even Muslims of other ethnicities. Uh, similarly, uh, the lower bureaucracies, changes are happening at, and these changes are not getting reflected in anywhere because the local media has been completely emasculated. You can say that it has been completely disempowered. Not that it uh, was effective 
earlier also, but uh, a few outlets, uh, primarily because of the, uh, you can say, uh, some courageous people who work there, they would uh, make these stories possible, like the stories which matter. But now uh, you say, say yesterday's change, like these blog development council, you won't find opinion pieces on what it entails, except for the statements made by a few politicians that it means that there's no, there won't be any politics uh, left in Kashmir. So it's happening uh, recently, um, only yesterday, a very senior uh, Kashmiri bureaucrat, he was, he was uh, shifted out of the education department. So there's this uh, senior uh, Hindu right-wing member, he was earlier associated with BJP. So he said that uh, he has been transferred because of because he was not promoting uh, Hindi, Sanskrit, and other things. He was only promoting uh, Kashmiri and Arabic, which is not true. So even these officials are being transferred uh, on say flimsy flimsy grounds. So this complete disempowerment and disposition of Muslims. This is, I think, the primary um, issue right now. And, and there doesn't seem to be anything happening uh, on the ground to counter it. Like um, this, um, the, pro, the alliance of pro-India politicians, it doesn't mean anything. In fact, they, have, they are the ones who, have, who are responsible for the, for the current state of affairs. So the, uh, take, for example, the most vocal of these pro-India politicians, Mahbuba Mufti. Only a few years ago, everybody remembers how she uh, described those people who are out on streets to fight, a sp fight the same hegemony she is talking about. And um, her minister, uh, Mr. Naeem Akhtar, who once, who only in 2016 justified the ban on Kashmir Reader, which I edited at that time. The newspaper was banned for three months. The same guy said um, that the continued publication of this newspaper was uh, a danger to peace. So, uh, yeah, this is a, this is a very, uh, it's, it's very grim, like it's, uh, the the I think the more uh, the tragedy of uh, the whole entire affair is that uh, it it doesn't get reflected anywhere in in its uh, in its true uh, you can say um, in its true like how how deep and how. Uh, uh, I yesterday I was talking to a journalist who is doing a story on how uh, this uh, number of suicides has increased since uh, August 5 last year. And um, the amount of um, uh, stress and also there's a, there's a there's a concerted assault on Kashmiri economy. Uh, like people have been uh, the the mining rights have been snatched from local people. Um, like uh, uh, not only that, now the la land use um, property tax has been imposed at a time when people have been uh, passing through a double lockdown since la last. And now see the see the bankruptcy of the Indian governments. Uh, discourse on Kashmir since last August. They have been saying that uh, uh, Article 370 was an impediment to development, economic development of the state. And it, it, in the parliament, they said the state was backward. Well, as all in economic indicators point to the contrary, uh, 
now oh, let's take uh, their argument uh, on its face value and when they say that it's a backward state you can't impose property tax in a backward state and if you really want to empower a backward state you can't take away mining rights from the people <laughs> yeah. they yeah. are taking yeah. over and they are taking over and uh, everything yeah yeah i it's very it's very interesting i the, the, there's a there's an article in scroll that talks about how um that that quotes um um naim akhtar you know the um the people's democratic party leader and he acknowledges the, the sentence was very was a bit amusing to me because it says that he acknowledged that the alliance still had to win popular support in jammu and kashmir which i found a very amusing um admission by a, a political party leader right um but athar and, and homa you know you <clears throat> have been in, involved in um this work for so long and but i want to kind of un, try to figure out you know not just um the granular depiction of kashmir but this global discourse on kashmir and and, and you know how it's lacking and how the 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 whole conceptualization of kashmir is insufficient maybe yeah i just wanted to actually jump in at the very end of uh, hilal's uh, response and very detailed and excellent response and i think the hypocrisies what we feel are the hypocrisies and what are the hypocrisies are hypocrisies because it is kashmir is not a state of india kashmir is colonized kashmir is an occupied territory it's an annexed territory awaiting united nations security council resolution number 47 that was passed in 1948 that calls for the kashmiris right to self determination to be exercised and i think the um, logical paradoxes that have been there from the get go from 1947 emerge precisely from the fact that there is one actual legal uh, reality and then there are these attempts by india to impose their their um, colonialism on us their attempt to uh, make fake news so if you i mean imagine how in the united states we are reeling under this uh, onslaught of fakeness and um you know fake news and lies so kashmir has been going through that since 1947 we have we have we have been under a regime of lies since 1947 and the the people that you mentioned of gupka resolution they are the administrators of a colonial regime they are puppets they are mannequins in the hand of a colonizing Uh, entity and not just colonizing and i think call it there's so much violence embedded in the term colonialism but this is uh you know with spurts it's it's a genocidal colonial regime it has been uh, genocidal there the the peaceful times the kind of calmer calmer times are still incrementally genocidal mm -hmm. because they disallow people from kashmir to come back they force people to be exiled and you know they're like there's a very recognizable spurt of violence that occurred in 1947 and it didn't just end in november 1947 it continued all the way until early 1950s when people were forced and like all you know like people have argued that even partition was the, the long partition right that the uh, the massacres and the migrations didn't just happen around august of 1947 they went all the way until 1950s so the same is the case with kashmir there was you know a recognizable in fact even in um view of the immense scale of the violence of partition the genocide and the violence the massacres the forced ethnic cleansing of kashmir stands out by its the immensity of scale even vis-a-vis -vis all of india even vis-a-vis -vis what was happening in the partition of west punjab and east punjab what was happening in uh, uh, in what was then east uh, pakistan or bangladesh now and west bengal even there because the population of kashmir 
was less than 1% of all the population of these areas. And the violence we suffered is 25% uh, of the violence that everyone else went through. So in scale, we suffered 2,500% more violence, whether it is the abduction of women, Muslim women, whether it is uh, uh, the, the scale of massacres, or whether it's the scale of forced ethnic cleansing. And in this case, the ethnic cleansing was not voluntary. And all of these things, the abductions, the massacres, the, the ethnic cleansing was carried out under the auspices of the Dogra Maharaja and Patel, who was the home minister of the newly independent India, right? So it sticks out even in that aspect that it wasn't just random. It wasn't a small state of Alwar that had a, you know, ethnic cleansing carried out at the behest of the Raja. This was India. Yeah. It was India, the post-colonial state, the newly independent state, the one where Nehru stands up on the ramparts of the Red Fort and says, you know, you know, this is a, the, the, the moment of destiny, tryst with destiny. That tryst with destiny entailed our colonization. Yeah, Huma, and also that uh, this point is often, I think, not mentioned uh, in any, I think it's not mentioned as uh, frequently as it should be that uh, in 1990, when the insurgency started, at least, I think more than 20, 20 uh, up to 25,000 people were forced to migrate to Pakistan. Absolutely. Like they, they live as refugees there. Uh, it's as recent as uh, like uh, 30 years ago and their number has been uh, only swelling since then. Like, uh, they are, I think, I think officially refugees in Pakistan. Exactly. They, they, they lived in border areas and they had to bear the brunt of, you know, who. Absolutely. Absolutely. Atar, you you know we're gonna talk. I want to talk about your your latest book. Um, I, I, I do want to. I, I just want, I want to, to yeah. add to what has already been said and laid out so well. Um, Hilal talked about what's happening currently, and uh, he talked about the domicile law and how people are really, really right now facing an ethno-national, fascist, neoliberal settler colonialism. And Homa drew our attention to the long duty of partition, whatever the tropes are, and how Kashmir has been invisibilized and how Kashmir has been snowed under all of that. I just wanted to kind of reiterate uh, both of what they said, uh, because I feel, uh, as you had earlier mentioned, how does the, you, you, I'm just summarizing your question about how, how does the international audience or people who look at Kashmir kind of uh, fathom what's happening. I think it's time for the entire international community to really, really see through India's neo-colonialism and to see it as a neo-imperial power. I think it's time. We have to get beyond yoga. We have to get beyond uh, Mahatma Gandhi, beyond all those tropes around India and really see for what it is. Uh, and when we talk about Kashmir, the kind of politics that has been played in Kashmir, the kind of elections, you know, one of the one of the brownie points that India wins each time and has in the last 72 years is talking about elections and electoral democracy, the basis of which is completely illegal. The basis of which are the very client politicians who are doing this People's Alliance at this moment. Uh, it's historically, you can kind of see the politics of smokescreen that India plays through these people. So when I look at this People's Alliance for the Gupkar Declaration that just happened recently, it's just, uh, someone was saying that it's a face-saving measure for these politicians. My take is they don't have a face. My take is that these people are actually playing India's politics as Humo already and uh, Hilal also established that these people are just puppets. They are client politicians. That's how they should be seen. And in Kashmir, no one really uh, pulls any, up. everyone kind of talks about them in that manner, especially as it's more and more Kashmiris are getting educated in their history. They kind of see them in their way, in this way. So it's, uh, it's no more pro-India politicians. It's more likely we know them as, see them as the kind of work that they have done for the carrying India's water for the last 72 years. They are client politicians. And 
if you look at many of the texts, many of the people who talk about uh, the Indian analysts who talk about Kashmir in their narrative, they've always handled Kashmir. And these are the handlers. So this is a new phase of uh, the politics, the pro-India politics and the politics of settler colonialism, where you prop up these people and now they are putting, they have, uh, they're kind of like trying to tell people they are downgrading the resistance movement. They're using the same vocabulary. They're using the vocabulary for, for we'll get our state back. No one really wants the state back. Everyone wants Kashmir back. Uh, whether they want it to exceed to Pakistan or they want it to be independent, but everyone is anti-India. And I think that's, uh, that's, th that's one of the glaring um, realities that the international community has to come face to face with, that uh, it's a settler colonial government at this moment. India is new imperial. It's not as peaceful as it, as it would like the international community to see it as. So what it has played in the last uh, 72 years is not democracy, it's politics of democracy. It's a facade that has been propped up. And these are the people, these alliance people are the very people who have done that. So just to reiterate what's already been said before. Yeah, now onto the question you were about, about to ask. Sorry. Yeah, actually, I mean, I, I, I was going to say that I, I want to talk about your book, but I think part of your book is excavating history and excavating the things that have not been talked about. And that and so I want to follow the thread that, that you guys have already been talking about, which is, you know, the, the, the long durée of, uh, of the settler colonialism. And I, I want to sit with that for a little bit because, um, you know, there have been comparisons made by some people, by a few, with, uh, with for instance, Palestine and apartheid, right? Um, the, the, the comparisons of, and the, the aspect of coloniality that, in, that calls these people, um, you know, these parties, uh, colonial collaborators, mm -hmm. right? And also this sense of temporality that we have not moved, that Kashmir has not moved, had never, never moved into a post-colonial period. That never happened, mm -hmm. right? And, but we've been talking since 1947 in both India and Pakistan as if, and, and Bangladesh as, you know, with then East Pakistan, um, as if post-colonialism was a moment or a time that had been reached, right? So I kind of want to ask a little bit more about, you know, this, this um, not just this longer history of Kashmir, but also this sense of um, distinctiveness that I think countries, both India and Pakistan perhaps have have missed because it's it's a it's a it's a place that has basically cut down the middle you know in a sense and is administered by India and by Pakistan separately in the Indian and Pakistani Kashmir administered Kashmir um, but occupied by India mm -hmm. right um, and that history retelling that history what do you think the challenges really are when you talk to people um, in terms of reasserting this, this narrative? In the last 72 years, one of the biggest uh, successes of Indian government has been to make Pakistan the aggressor and them uh, the benevolent uh, savers of Kashmiri people uh, in 1947. And when, when they call, I, I think part of the labor that Kashmiri uh, scholars, critical Kashmiri uh, scholars and journalists and people who are writing have to do is tell the world that India is an equal aggressor. And by the machinations, uh, maybe they knew the international jargon very well at that time and they were, they were utilizing it in that manner. And uh, that part, that's part of the labor that we have to do uh, to tell the world that we have to revisit the history that has been fed, that has been very deliberately fed, uh, fed and engineered and recorded where India comes across as this very democratic country that's trying to save Kashmiri people. Again, at the, so again, these client politicians become very important for that moment uh, who peddled that kind of politics inside Kashmir, allowed India to appear as this benevolent democracy and which it has utilized for the last 72 years. So part of the labor is to tell the world that India is an equal aggressor and there is literature to back it up. There are historians to back it up. There are people who are living uh, histories who have life experiences and who will tell you. I think Huma uh, has a really nice anecdote 
about her life, about her ancestors who went through that. Uh, and those are the conversations that we've had and that have evolved, uh, that made us even understand our own histories. Uh, why do I know the kind of history that I know? Why did I not know what happened to Huma uh, before uh, we met 15, 16 years ago? Where was that history? Because that history was hidden to Kashmiris. We didn't, we didn't, no one really talks about Jammu massacre, which is the most important uh, massacre, I mean, if, uh, for the significance that it had for what happened to Kashmir, the way its politics was turned. So I feel all of those things have been very, very conveniently, very deliberately engineered by India so that they became invisibilized. Uh, that again, you know, the narrative of development has been also used for which, uh, because West understands some, uh, in some of the words that West understands as democracy and development. And they have always been utilized by what India is, the neo-colonial uh, imperial power it is, uh, that now it's rising and now we are getting kind of like the entire world is seeing uh, the, the kind of politics it plays. But Kashmir has known that politics since 1947 itself. And uh, Kashmiris didn't, not that Kashmiris didn't know it firsthand, but because there is this hegemon who is writing the history, who's telling the history to the world. So part of the labor that Kashmiris at this moment, whether they are in Kashmir, they're outside Kashmir, is showing what the true face of India is and what it has been for the last 72 years and how it has utilized client politicians, collaborators, and how it has actually you know, if you follow the life history of those people who we call the client politicians, extremely visionary at different parts of history. And then suddenly they convert into these people that their own people start hating. So that history, that's the, that's the, that's the lot and tragedy of Kashmiris because they have been handled by India since 1947, especially there's no governance, there's no politics, there's no electoral democracy, there's only handling of these people so that the, the settler colonial policies that are being put into place now, brazenly, not that they haven't been put into place in 1947, even the Article 370, which a lot of people, <clears throat> so there's, there's mixed feelings about Article 370. It established Kashmir's relationship to India but who established that relationship? Was it the Kashmiris? Was it the dominant uh, Kashmiris who were actually exiled at that time? Homa's family is part of that story as well. Uh, are these the people who actually rose in the insurrection in 1989? No, it was a set of people, a section of people who were following the, these client politicians. Um, and at that moment, they established that relationship with India again those people were also hugely nationalist. They didn't see their future with India in the same manner. They saw themselves as hugely unique. And that's why they had to kind of draw this negotiation. Uh, uh, they had to establish this uh, relationship with India through Article 370. But Article 370 was a Trojan horse that was put inside Kashmir through which all the laws that India wanted passing started passing in 1948 itself and 1949 when 370 becomes it solidifies what happens is that you have uh, you, the fundamental rights charter of indian uh, constitution passes into kashmir uh, preventive detention administrative detention becomes law so that's how you criminalize kashmiri politics for independence and filibicide so what ha what's happening now has already happened. I think part of the labor that Kashmiri scholars, Kashmiri writers, Kashmiri journalists are doing right now, uh, it's very difficult for people inside Kashmir to write the way they would want because they have, a, they have censorship, they have all kinds of laws, draconian laws that can stop them from writing. Uh, they're all in place. And now you have the media gag, uh, which allows, which essentially uh, call, has these set of bureaucrats who can say that they are producing fake news. And that has happened. They have been put under terror laws just because someone said that they're, they're producing fake news when it was not fake news. So, so, though, so that's, the, that's the kind of excavation uh, that is being done, has been done for the past 20 years. And Kashmiris were slowly, we, we actually had to go back and read our history. Yeah. No one taught us our history. We read Indian history. For the longest time in many schools, even now, uh, we, talked, uh, we talked about India's independence history while we did not know what was happening to us because what was in every decade, Kashmiris have risen 
in every decade they have demanded plebiscite, they have demanded the right to uh, self-determination, uh, quote unquote, independence as well. But what has not been, uh, it's, it was not institutionalized because there's no institutions to uh, narrativize what has been, there's no institutions to commemorate that kind of knowledge. So as a result, my generation, Hilal's generation, Homa's generation, we actually had to go back to these, to these knowledges that had already been subjugated, that had been, that had been thrown in the dustbin of history. We had to go back to them very informally to really understand who we are and understand stories like why was this person exiled? Why is this person's uncle in Pakistan? Why do they have to get a visa and they have to go, they actually have to go through a different uh, border in between India and Pakistan when we have uh, the line of control. So why is it line of control? These are questions, these were questions that no one could even answer for you because such was the level of repression. So the other uh, thing that we also have to understand when people use the word violence, when people use the word peace, that there was peace before 1989. No, there was never any peace. There was absence of direct violence and not even that direct violence because Indian army was the aggressor that landed inside Kashmir in 1947. Aggression started from that very moment. So what you actually had was you, you have a region that is de facto under Indian occupation, and then you're paying politics of democracy. So that's what the international community needs to understand how democracy has been used as a weapon inside Kashmir. And then you set these people up, you nominate them. And that's uh, when uh, Hilal is talking about the block development committees, that's what uh, the BJP is doing now. They are setting up people who will be, who will be in these little committees kind of doing local governance. Now they will sell local governance to the world. And the world is going to be very happy because local governance is such a nice word. It's such a nice, uh, it's a, it's such a nice democratic word. But we have to understand how India uh, ha is a neo-colonial power. We have to look at Kashmir through that vantage, from Kashmiri's vantage. We have to understand how democracy has been deployed. There's no democracy. There can never be any democracy in a place where there is Armed Forces Special Powers Act because that act only comes into force when there is failure of local governance. If it's still on, why is politics being played inside Kashmir? Yeah. So all of these are valid questions. Only some people can ask them. Kashmiris at the moment, especially from August 5th, they cannot ask these questions. There's a gag on them, which has been institutionalized at this moment. It was always there. Now it's been more in institutionalized. They are more gagged than before. So what we need to do at this moment is that have people who can show solidarity ask these questions. Like, how can you, how can you kill and repress and blind people and still call yourself a democracy? So yeah, I mean, I think one very interesting thing, and I would love 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 Huma for you to follow up on this with the. With, with possibly the anecdote that to refer to, but this idea that Article 370 is a Trojan horse. I think that's a very powerful idea because I think that in a way, Article 370 has indeed been depicted as a violation, but it has not been depicted in the historical complexity that even in when it was in when it was in place, Article 370 was still a tool of oppression. Giving special status did not mean good things necessarily, right? Um, and in fact, enabled um, repression and settler colonialism. So I'd love to to hear more about that because I, I don't think that that's a a way of thinking about Article 370 that we hear very often. I think Article 370 is. Is, is, is a sedimented form from the instrument of accession. And that instrument of accession is in itself um, under doubt, whether it was signed before, and, and most scholars believe that it was actually signed after the Indian army actually had landed in uh, Kashmir. Mm -hmm. So uh, there, there's violation of even that tree, you know, instrument from the get-go. And what power, what legitimacy did that Dogra Maharaja Hari Singh have to sign as such an instrument? Like if we go back legally and by and ethically, what right did this draconian, and I would say Hindutva prior to the name Hindutva, we have in Kashmir, we have lived under multiple colonial regimes from the Mughals to the Afghans, to the Sikhs, 
to the Dogra and now India. And the Sikh and the Dogra regimes were Hindutva Awanalet before the name Hindutva was coined by Savarkar in 1925. We lived through what was, you know, coded in Manusmriti. We were Dalitized, we were looked upon as lower beings. Our humanity was disregarded. Kashmiri Muslims, the majority of Kashmiri Muslims were considered begar, which is indentured labor. Anyone could call out my father or grandfather or great grandfather and ask them to carry this load from here to there or carry this huge burden from Sirinagar all the way to Gilgit Baltistan because Gilgit Baltistan was a conquered territory by the Dogra Maharajas at multiple points, right? So we have to go back into, and since you, uh, you know, you work with SAG, is that how you pronounce it, right? And you are very much embedded in looking at leftist discourses and um, proposing a more radical leftist discourse. I think it's of great interest that you guys should be looking at the fact that before the uh, 1886 Haymarket Affair, which we celebrate every day, since then as the International Labor Day, Kashmir had its first labor uprising in 1865, when the shawl buffs, the weavers of the shawls, uh, came out in protest in uprising. And, they, and you know, two dozen uh, uh, shawl weavers were massacred and hundreds injured, right? So there, there's an entire history, which is very, and I think it's not a, it's not a coincidence. I don't think it's an innocent, benign, um, um, you know, it's not a benign unknowledge. Let's, let me put it this way. It's a very deliberate, cultivated amnesia regarding certain histories. And, uh, and then again in 1931, you know, uh, Hilkak, Hilal's grandfather, if I'm not wrong, uh, was martyred during, right? Hilal, am I right? Am I, I hope I'm uh, not. My great grandfather. Your great grandfather. So my God, your generations are like very much smaller than my generations. My grandmother was born in 1896. So, you know, Hilal's great grandfather was martyred in 1931. Uh, it, the day we celebrate as the Martyrs Day, the Yom Eshav Shohda. And so these histories have not been um, taken account of. The left in Pakistan, the left in India, has ignored us vehemently, you know. And and um, it, it, the left within uh, within Kashmir, as such, was never allowed to really take root. Yeah. Uh, any any intellectuals, anyone who ever spoke, was quickly exiled, even at the get go. So the, I think the incident that Atha wants me to talk about is my aunt was uh, uh, the first woman to get a BA amongst all Kashmiri women, so uh, Hindus as well as Muslims, and um, way back in 1931, I think. And then she go, went ahead and got a BT, the bachelor's in teaching it, which would now be B.Ed. And she was um, the inspectress of schools, which was amazing for that point, because there was no woman uh, who was, uh, if, you, if you all know Agha Shahid Ali, right, the very famous poet of Kashmir, his father used to be an inspector of schools and he writes about it as I was the first Muslim to be inspector of schools, which is wrong because my aunt was a Muslim too and she was a woman, mm -hmm. but obviously machismo doesn't allow him to think about this woman. So in any case, way back in 1948, she was, there were so many people who were arrested and thrown into jails. I don't have access to the record of the jails, how many people were thrown in. But according to my aunt, and this is all in UN documentation, because she was interviewed by United Nations. She had gone to see um, uh, uh, Corbell, who was the head of the United Nations uh, committee that had come to visit Indian occupied Jammu and Kashmir to see how it's doing, what do the people want as a precursor to organizing plebiscites. And within a year of, uh, of the annexation, occupation of Kashmir by India, um, thousands and thousands of people who did not, who, who might have loved, liked Sheikh Abdullah, but they hated India, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so there is, there is a paradox also there in that moment which was exploited. And I think even Sheikh Abdullah 
turned a blind eye to the Jammu genocide, to the genocide that was slowly also within the valley because it was getting rid of people that politically didn't, he didn't agree with that were um, his nemesis and that they were his arch, uh, arch rivals, Ulam Abbas, the, the head of the Muslim conference. And um, so my aunt was not allowed to go and see Korbel and she was a sari wearing woman, which is rare for probably for Kashmiri women, Muslim women even today, but she used to wear a sari because she, we didn't have college. When she got her BA and her, you know, if we, we didn't have women colleges. Mm. Uh, it was my younger aunts who were able to go to SP college and get a BA there. But when my older aunt was getting a BA, women weren't allowed. So she went, she had gone to Lahore college and government college and got her degrees there. And as she wore a burqa, she borrowed a burqa from my daddy, from my grandmother, who, who would wear a burqa when going out in public. She borrowed her burqa over her sari so that she wouldn't be recognizable. She went, and with Agha Shahid Ali's actually aunt, these two ladies, they went all the way to Korbel and said, you know, at the last moment, they took off the hijab and they said, hey guys, and, and they were both fluent in English. So they could speak to this guy. Uh, the way many other, uh, uh, um, you know, people, the literacy level amongst Kashmiri Muslims was less than 2% in the 1931 census, right? So in 1947, 48, let's imagine it doubles. Let's be very generous. Let's imagine it doubles. Then it's less than 4%, right? Which is minuscule. It is absolutely minuscule. And it's an indication of our socioeconomic illness. We were so oppressed compared to the Dalits in say Maharashtra, their literacy level was higher than that of Kashmiri Muslims, right? That tells you where we were in sociologically, economically. And uh, for that, um, and this was within SP college where they had met uh, Korbel. And they told him that, you know, go to the people yourself. Don't just go on this guided tour that Sheikh Abdullah has organized for you. Go to all the people. There are thousands and thousands in prisons and lo and behold, she was arrested. There was like a mini riot within the college when all the students got to realize what is happening. And they were up in arms and uh, the, the police came in and she and her uh, friend, Agha Ali's aunt, they were both arrested and sent to a jail in Jammu where they, they, they uh, remained in prison for more than three weeks. And, um, and then from there, both of them and their families, entire families, their husbands, their children, were handcuffed, put on a plane, and sent to Pakistan. Just, you know, barefoot, whatever they were wearing, nothing. They could, they could not take, it wasn't their will. It wasn't uh, their determination. But within, with handcuffs, these two families were sent in a plane to Pakistan and deposited in Pakistan. And they were exchanged for um, a Dogra person, Gandhara Singh, who had been the governor of Gilgit Baltistan and who the Gilgit Baltistanis themselves in their spontaneous uprising prior to the annexation and occupation of Kashmir, they had dismantled the Dogra regime. Because while India, British India was had the quit India movement, we had the quit Kashmir movement. Our movements were not the same. Our histories are not the same. Right? We had a quit Kashmir movement, which was to quit this draconian, you know, Hindutva, Hindu fundamentalist uh, col colonial regime of the Dogras away from uh, Kashmir. And when I say Kashmir, when I'm saying Kashmir right now, I'm actually meaning the entire uh, princely state of Jammu and Kashmir, Gilgit Baltistan, Poonch, uh, uh, Jagir, it was called. So there, and there are multiple histories. You know, they're not, they're not homogenous. But they all had, they were all under the extremely tyrannical rule of the Dogras. And Dogras, imagine if United States had gone to, you know, Afghanistan and used their warlords to become Minister A and Minister B. And then these guys would, would rule Afghanistan for 101 years. That is our history. That the British sold uh, uh, Jammu and Kashmir to a warlord who had betrayed the Sikh uh, dynasty. And that's how he got to be the, the, the he, he didn't really have the money to buy except from stolen money and the money that he extracted from us, we were, pay, we were made to pay for our own sale, yeah. our labor, our taxes up to 80% 
I mean, imagine that our labor was used to pay for our sale, for our own slavery. There is there's very little comparison to that. I think something in, in the history of settler colonial history of the United States, of the Turtle Islands, comes close because mm -hmm. the labor of the enslaved human beings from Africa was used to generate capital. And then it was used to buy and kidnap and loot more human beings from Africa and then fed back into the triangular trade, yeah. right? So that's the, this history of the Pashmina, you know, or, or the Paisley. The, this is a colonial history where Britain and the Dogra re regime are equally complicit. And Britain, I think as the initiator, maybe even more so. So we need to go and grab the, uh, you know, Britain by its collar as well. Yeah. They're answerable. You know, and it, are of a left scholars, you know, people like, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm forgetting the name of the, the guys who sing for Lal and teach at Lums. Mm. On Twitter, we have these yeah. very bizarre tweets from them who will say, <laughs> Yeah, Tamur. And, you know, he'll, he'll say really uninformed stuff about Kashmir, propping up certain collaborator politicians because they belong to CPI, you know, the Communist Party of India, the parliamentary branch. And these are as, they have as collaborator politics exactly, as yeah. anyone else in NC or PDP. And they're not able to see that. Mm -hmm. People like uh, Vijay Prashad, mm -hmm. where are they? You know, I mean, for the longest time, they, they have not wanted to call it an occupation. They've not, you know, it walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, it actually tastes like a duck, and it kills like a duck, you know? So it is what it is. And uh, so it's, it, there's a lot of hypocrisy that we have failed. We've, we have faced intense um, oppression, discursive oppression from people we should have by rights had alliances from, solidarity from. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And this is, you know, this is an interesting, um, Homa, thank you for priming me for this question that I really wanted to ask because it's something that I've, I've I have, talked to Hilal about before, um, but in when you talk about, you know, yes, Sag is very interested in, you know, really digging into like radical narratives within um, this, within South Asia. But uh, we, we do realize that a lot of these are very local narratives that you cannot like zoom out and expect to get like a coherent narrative, right? Like you can't expect to get a coherent Adivasi narrative if you are talking about the history of India, right? Um, but you know, it's funny that when we talk about the Pakistani left, that the Pakistani left for quite a while um, has, because of the anti-nationalist bent, um, has really failed to see um, why it is that Kashmiri people apparently do not criticize Pakistan enough, right? And I remember talking to Hilal about this in 2016 because, you know, there were protests um, that had been happening and, you know, we were having the mass blindings, you know, at that time. And so, you know, I want to talk about the, the struggle on the ground. But, you know, I asked Hilal about, um, you know, Burhan Wani at the time, which was something that everybody was talking about. And I, I asked him about, you know, the Hezbol Mujahideen and Pakistan's complicity with regards to, um, you know, enabling terrorist organizations, which is something that the Pakistani left talks about quite a bit, criticizing the state with regards to that. And Hilal was like, I'm very sick of this false equivalence narrative. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I really had to sit and think and be like, yeah. yeah. That is false equivalence. So Hilal, I'd love, I'd love for you to talk about that because I think that for me was a very teachable moment. And that false equivalence narrative really dogs the left in ev everywhere when they're talking about Kashmir, right? And can I add only about Kashmir? Yeah. The same progressive leftists will have a much more nuanced stance when it's, we're talking about Hamas. Mm. That's it, over to you Hilal. That's good. Yeah. Uh, see, what I am worried about is that it's not that it has been invisible or people don't know about it. See, we're talking about 370, how it was being used as um, basically as a disempowerment tool. Mm. 
in fact, uh, I'm uh, quoting here, uh, it's Nehru who said in Indian parliament that uh, Article 370 is part of a certain transitional provisional arrangements. It's not a permanent part of the constitution. It's part of, it's a part so long as it remains so. As a matter of fact, as Home Minister pointed out, it has been eroded. I repeat that it is fully integrated. So we feel this process of gradual erosion of Article 370 is going on. We should allow it to go on. That process is continuing. So this was not something like the pro-India politicians didn't know. I think the, we, we are right now talking of the great betrayal. I think nobody has been betrayed as much as the National Conference by India. Mm. So, um, or now the uh, PDP, which was like, um, which many people said it is the creation of the intelligence, Indian intelligence agencies. So it, uh, and these histories, these these were talked about. It, they would they may not be the mainstream, but they they were there. That is why we had insurgency in 1990. Yeah. It was not possible uh, if there had been a forgetting. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the question is that why is this not creating an impact? Like why is not the world taking notice in the sim sim simplest terms? And even right now. When, when like um, the most sophisticated form of settler colonialism has been set in motion. Even right now, why is not the world taking notice? And why are even like um, the people who are at one time champions of like Palestinian struggle, even the Arab, in some Arab countries, why have they like suddenly decided to turn a blind eye? So, and if you see that this has been the Kashmiri tragedy for the past 70 years, whenever these, uh, this, this, um, this uh, erosion of autonomy, actually, it was completed in the 50s itself. So there's nothing new here. Even the settler colonialism, it was already set in motion in the form of hundreds of um, army camps, many Indian government uh, offices, which had no jurisdiction in Kashmir, now they are here. So the employee, naturally the employees will also come, they, they have settled here and over the time. So that, that has been happening for long. So who, what I'm interested in knowing is, Whose failure has it been that Kashmir has never been taken notice of like it should have been? Uh, and that is when I think we should uh, focus the light on the, 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 the need for the introspection. Yeah. <laughs> so if the Pakistani state, uh, they call Kashmir its own territory, um, the, the the resistance movement itself in inside Kashmir. Um, it's true that people have in the past seventy years, um, the Kashmiri people itself they have provided uh, India. You can say they had some season of legitimacy here, mm -hmm. in the form of the. Like, no doubt that it's very murky, like how elections have been conducted. It is, it's, a, it's one, one long tale of betrayals. Even, in the, even Indian politicians have talked about it. So uh, no two opinions there, but uh, uh, this, this, uh, the narrative should also now shift on uh, why Kashmir has remained invisible if we say it. This is the question we should be asked right now. Besides, obviously, of which command um, Athar are saying, like digging the histories and talking about uh, to keep, uh, because the narrative uh, at this time, um, there is this, um, uh, you can say, the live danger of 
uh, entire Kashmiri story getting buried under the um, a new uh, form of uh, settler colonialism and uh, uh, the dismantling that is happening. Now you can't, even, everything has been criminalized. You can't talk about uh, even, even, uh, even an incident which is happening uh, in its true perspective. So uh, it's important uh, to focus on these questions, like why is Kashmir not getting enough uh, attention uh, world over? Yeah, and, and 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 part of this narrative obviously is, you know, the what 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 other your book resuscitates, right? Which is the stories of resistance, the oral histories that need to be resuscitated and excavated and thought about, you know, with like in, in, your, in your book um, that you've um, co-edited, Can You Hear Kashmiri Women Speak? You, you have a collection of 12 essays that talk about, you know, Kashmiri women and their aspects of resistance and living under oppression, etc. And I'd love for you to talk about how, what, what tools do we ha really have at our disposal in order to do this kind of work that all three of you are talking about, which is um, making things um, non-invisible, you know? And as, as, a, as an interesting thing, it's, it's, it's funny that there's this phrase, world's largest open air prison, that is always um, referred to with Gaza. But if you write that same phrase and then put Kashmir in, you will see a few hits <laughs> that talk about Kashmir because by, you know, just by square miles. Yeah. Um, it's a very interesting thing that, 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 that Kashmir has to not be in put in solidarity with Gaza, but in competition with it almost, which is mm -hmm. extremely bizarre, right? So, yeah, I mean, I'd love to hear about these, um, you know, weird narratives and also invisible narratives. So the first thing I, I discussed, I think that really popped out to me, we recently, uh, so there's, um, I co-edited a journal for identities, which is called um, s something the series, but it's on Kashmir and Palestine, where we kind of uh, talked about both the narratives and had some scholars from Kashmir, scholars from Palestine and kind of narrativized that how they're different and how they're same. Yeah. And then there's also this question about how uh, that already has been talked about how the Indian left, or even just the people who want to give solidarity, especially the Indian feminists, how they talk about the Palestinian situation, but when they see the same thing happening in Kashmir, there they throw in their lot with the nationalistic narrative. So there are all of these uh, things that uh, are very generative of uh, thinking about these two disputes and also how they're one of the oldest uh, disputes on the UN agenda. So uh, yeah, that's, that's there. Uh, and Kashmir is already called the open air prison. So going back to thinking about what tools do we have available? I see this, this is like a, this is a multi-pronged, multi-layer project and people have to kind of uh, uh, start working on it from all sides. Where history really plays a very important part, what we are actually right, right now doing, even in my ethnographic work, the book that I recently published about women's activism and thinking about military occupation, it's people's memory against Indian narrative or against Indian history. That's what we are sort of excavating, all of us. Uh, and that's what we are being, uh, that, that's what we are being kind of uh, sensitized to as things are happening to us, as active uh, colonialism is really not, not just knocking at our doors, but, but uh, it's really there and things are in motion at, the, at this particular moment. And, and when we talk about, I just wanted to answer a couple of questions, uh, not answer, but pick a couple of uh, points that I thought were important. Thinking about murky politics and rigged elections in Kashmir, I don't think it's only a po problem of rigged elections in Kashmir. They had to be rigged because the basis of those elections is illegal. United Nations categorically tells uh, Kashmir, uh, tells India at that moment that you can't hold these elections while the dispute is sub -judice and calls that entire operation as out of order. And the reason this becomes important for us at this moment is it's not 
that we are losing time in understanding this history uh, because it does nothing to stop the colonialism happening, the settler colonialism. But I think that's where the work is multi-pronged, that the excavation of history needs to be done by people who are doing that. And then the people who are translating all of these facts and figures need to do that labor as well. And then there are activists, they have their job cut out on ground, but not much is happening on ground at this particular moment in Kashmir. So what kind of, what are the tools that are disposable except for drumming up international solidarity and using the tools of history, using the tool of subjugated knowledges, bringing them forward. And whatever is at your disposal, be that anthropological, be that journalistic, be that um, sociological, be that uh, whatever else disciplines there are, we bring them. When Lancet uh, last year, Lancet, uh, Lancet, the medical journal, uh, again, we're talking about the colonizers tools, but I'm just using it as a standard of something that uh, the world trusts in because it's a medical journal, cutting edge technology and all of that. It wrote an editorial on Kashmir talking about the Kashmir issue, uh, which a lot of, um, which the doctor's body in India took notice of. And then they were like, why are they butting head in our affair? But that's where we have reached. That's the critical juncture Kashmir is at. It hasn't paid attention to so far, I feel, because India has been so successful in, uh, in kind of sidelining the United Nations narrative. And they also had control over uh, the vocabulary that was being used. And at the same time, it's also uh, when we look at, I, I mean, I don't consider Pakistan an equal aggressor that, the, that, has been, uh, that has been the Indian narrative, because we also have to look at the history of who the, who the Azad, how did the Azad Kashmir even come into being? You know, all of those things are very important. I don't, I don't see Azad Kashmir as occupied uh, as much as controlled or administered or governed, because those people actually liberated themselves. And there is history that we can go back to. So we can, what I mean to say, I'm not saying that, oh, we have to get down bogged in the nitty gritty of history. What I'm saying is that this can be historically fought. And this can be fought by the contemporary knowledge that we have that Kashmiris at this moment are undergoing the worst form of settler colonialism, which doesn't look like settler colonialism to the world as well. And, and also thinking about how did Palestine uh, start uh, its uh, well, journey towards this uh, immense form of tyranny that uh, the Israeli settler colonialism has uh, wrecked on them from 1907 onwards. Uh, the, 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 the things that Kashmir has undergone for the last 72 years and what has come to head at the moment, settler colonialism on steroids, this is exactly the same history in a, in a way, in, in a different manner on different people. You're passing the laws, uh, you're changing the names, you're also, there is a debate and Hilal can talk much more about this. There is a debate at the moment about the official language in Kashmir. What, what is it going to be? Is it going to be Urdu? Is it going to be Hindi? Is it going to be all of these languages? I don't know what the verdict on uh, that is because so much is happening in Kashmir. It's hard to keep track of every day, the laws that are passed, the, the kind of statutes that are given. So it's, it's becoming very, very difficult for Kashmiris to comprehend. So that's why I feel uh, we, we don't have to treat this moment any different from what's happened in 1947, because there was a moment in the 1960s when uh, the president and the prime minister of Kashmir were de demoted to chief minister and governor of Kashmir. The nomenclature was changed by one of the statutes. And Kashmiris rose in the same manner. They have been rising. Maybe there was not active armed struggle at that moment, but they were rising in every decade, in every decade, in every phase they have risen. And they have uh, asked for their rights to be restored. Uh, and again, it becomes very tricky when we say rights to be restored under the Indian constitution, because not many Kashmiris would subscribe to that. But there is also violence of discourse, violence of vocabulary that has been wrecked on Kashmiris. Uh, so, so that's a separate uh, issue, but, but Kashmiris have risen in every decade uh, to kind of like hearkening back to the UN resolutions, hearkening back to right to self-determination, hearkening back to the rule of law uh, and justice basically. And then a couple of points that I, I feel are very important uh, for the world community to know that even if a territory is being occupied, international, according to international laws, uh, it has to be governed. There is to be some form of civil governance till there is restoration 
of uh, whatever form of uh, resolution there is or implementation of that resolution. Under that, I feel like uh, when we think Think about uh, the way uh, India weaponized de development right from the get-go, like the 60s were this huge moment of um, state feminism and development inside Kashmir. There did, there was this uh, politics or uh, politics of governance and politics of azadi. So mm -hmm. that's that's how I see it in my work. I kind of see that I, I really see them. Uh, and I have talked to people and Hilal will uh, bear me out, Huma will bear me out. There are people who would who have talked, and I have written about this, where they said that even if I give my vote, it's Sadak Pani and Bijli, meaning it's uh, the street, roads, and uh, electricity. Uh, but that doesn't mean I'm going to give up my uh, politics for Azadi. And India has narrativized every election that it has conducted as, a, as, as, as if we are endorsing Indian rule. And I think that's also another excavation that needs to be done. Again, not to get bogged down in answering what India is throwing against you, but I feel like we need to be armed with that kind of information as well as we are fighting active settler colonialism at the moment and trying to see what international mechanisms there are uh, and also telling them that this is a valid and genuine people's resistance right from the word get go because now the word terrorism is just thrown by India on everyone. Huma and I are tag team of terrorists who <laughs> go around the world talking about Kashmir resistance, that's what she and I are called. So when people who are writing and genuinely trying to excavate people's history, genuinely trying to bring forth subjugated knowledges when they are called terrorists, I think that's a moment where we have to reclaim our history, but we also have to answer the active moment. And how do you answer that active moment? I feel this is, this is, very, this is a very right moment. I talked about this uh, at some place several weeks ago, that when Standing Rock, uh, when they were when the police was trying to arrest the activists there, uh, people from all across the world they were signing into uh, Standing Rock on this very repressive platform of Facebook. Sorry to say, <laughs> but to me that was a very important moment. It was this tapping into collective international conscience and mm -hmm. trying to tell them that we are all in this together and let's all go and help. I feel Kashmir is also at that very moment, but what really uh, doesn't work in Kashmir's favor is, <clears throat> quote unquote, uh, the usage of Islamic terrorism, yeah. quote unquote, Pakistan's proxy war. Yeah. So we have to do these reclamations from uh, why not, why it isn't a Pakistan's proxy war only, how it cannot only be that, how it is not this 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 uh, this very damaging stereotype of Islamic stereo st uh, Islamic terrorism. So all those stereotypes we do have to, and everyone is reclaiming. Everyone, when we are trying to understand Kashmir's present moment, we are actually trying to answer Kashmir's distorted history. So I feel we're already doing the labor of history every day, uh, but we really need to contextualize it for the international community and kind of bring all these nuances. And, and how Kashmiris, like, you know, Hilal will speak to this because he he's from downtown Kashmir, I'm from downtown Kashmir, and we have seen people who would uh, worship uh, Sheikh Abdullah mm -hmm. and still continue to do so because he had that kind of visionary politics that when he was using that politics to fight the Dogra regime, mm -hmm. but then how it was appropriated by India willy-nilly, and then how, uh, how Pakistan at that uh, time uh, played into the equation, how even personal politics and personal friendships kind of influenced people's loyalties. So I think that that needs to be excavated, but not at the cost of what has happened to Kashmir today. We can't really unsee what India has done in the last 72 years, and especially in the last 33 years. Uh, we can't unsee what has been a continuum, like uh, the quote that Halal read earlier, how Jawaharlal Nehru already knew that this is a Trojan horse and the uh, 370 is going to be eroded. And they duped Kashmiris at that time. They duped the client politicians at that time. They told them that this is something. And, and the client politicians, they thought that they were being smart because they dissolved the constituent assembly that needed to be uh, there if 370 was ever to be taken away. They thought that we've done that work and now that it's nowhere, this assembly, it's gone. So it, it's all, almost, it's ironclad. That's what Sheikh Abdullah called it. He said that autonomy is ironclad, but it wasn't ironclad because we cannot unsee uh, 
what Indian government has done in the last 72 years, especially in the last 33 years. And when I say, when, and, and I also want us to kind of pay attention to the fact that when we sometimes talk, there's this, again, violence of the multi-layeredness of the Indian politics in Kashmir. Uh, it seems like Kashmir is a defending 370, but we also have to consider that 370 wasn't only about governance, it was about territorial sovereignty. That was another clause that was added to it under 35A. I think most Kashmiris were worried about 35A than 370 because 370 was almost gone. Yeah. So the territorial sovereignty that now Indians are going to come, not that they were not coming already, not that they didn't have businesses inside Kashmir, but that's a different, uh, way of coming in, different way of... So Kashmiris uh, technically ha were territorially sovereign people under these two clauses. They saw this with a love-hate relationship that, okay, uh, at least right now, I, I, I don't know what my other panelists, how they see it, and I would love to know more from them. But to me, it's more like the territorial sovereignty was saved by 35A, uh, which sometimes kind of translated into Kashmiris as if they were defending 370. But right. that, wasn't, that wasn't the entire situation. There was more nuance to it. It right. also meant that you were keeping the Indians away. You were, you were still having the franchise and you had the rights as you would have for any other citizen. That's why they were called state subjects as Kashmiris. We all have a extra uh, citizenship document, which is the state subject, which we all have, and which the domicile law, which is unilaterally tinkered with, uh, has, has kind of taken away from Kashmiris. So it is stripping down of not just fundamental rights and human rights, but citizenship rights outright. And that was the final nail in the coffin. And that's why it's a very important moment. And that's why this, uh, the, the neo-colonialism and settler colonialism that India is propagating needs to be uh, uh, categorically told to the world that this isn't any kind of democracy happening. This isn't any kind of internal law and order problem. This isn't Pakistan's proxy war. This isn't insurgency. This is outright settler colonialism that is being propagated by the neo-colonial India. So if I can, you know, quickly also just make another point about Burhan Wani and Facebook, because I lost my original 10 year old Facebook account for posting photographs of his funeral prayer, which was the prayer was done more than 40 times and there were more than 700,000 people, you know, a quarter of a million people in an occupied area where the cell phone services had been cut off and the total population under uh, Indian occupation is uh, less than 13 million. So to, for almost a million to come up for posting those pictures, that Facebook account of mine was uh, uh, permanently disabled. And yesterday I got another notice from Facebook saying that something I posted, I think uh, uh, is from Kashmir Reader actually from 2017 that I am transgressing the guidelines of Facebook for posting an article about Burhan Wani. And I want to make a point that he was not a terrorist. Not just he was not a terrorist, but when sometimes we offhandedly say, oh, you know, such and such a Kashmiri got killed and he was innocent. We are, we are kind of falling into a trap which is laid for us by the Indian state, which means that those of us who don't pick up the gun, who don't join the guerrilla movement are somehow more innocent than another person who picks up the gun and joins the guerrilla movement. Now the, the position of regard, uh, according to international law is that people of any occupied state, all people under occupation have a right and a responsibility to fight the occupation by all means possible. Mm -hmm which includes armed struggle. Yeah. It does not include killing civilians, but it includes all armed struggle. So Burhan Wani was an absolute, he was a fighter. He was a guerrilla fighter. He had never actually, he'd never killed anyone. He'd never injured anyone. His, this, that was an extrajudicial killing done by the Indian state, right? And the and, you know, I, I actually really, I want to sue Facebook right now to make that particular point. Yeah. And, and, this, and we all need to shred that Gandhian, um, the politics of, of 
facade of nonviolence, which is in my mind, intensely violent because it's demanding nonviolence from people under waves and waves, ongoing waves of violence. It's not asking for nonviolence from the occupiers. It's not asking for nonviolence from the army that is raping and torturing and killing and disappearing our people, but it's asking us to be nonviolent. What does it even mean, right? I mean, it's just mind boggling. It is crazy. And, um, and you know, going back to your earlier question, why doesn't the international community know about us? I think it has to do something with uh, our much worse socioeconomic educational position in 1947 vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis the Palestinians, right? So I, I, told, I gave you the number of, you know, let's imagine that the literacy level uh, doubled from 1931. Let's imagine it was 4% in 1947, which, you know, again, it's dubious. Um, we did not, we do not still have a word Nakba, which Palestinians have for their 1948 uh, a catastrophe. We do not have, you know, like, and I'll give you the numbers. In 1947, the population of the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir is projected to be around 4 million. Out of that, anywhere from 237,000 people, so either a quarter million to half a million were killed. And uh, as you know about partition, these, two, these numbers are not, you know, accurate, but the lower, lower limit was quarter million and it goes up to half a million, and anywhere from half a million to 1.1 million people were forcibly exiled over a period of three years, right? So for four, total population of 4 million, to have anywhere from 800,000 to 1.5 million, like, you know, either 20% to 37% population was actually junted out of the Indian occupied side. That is, that is absolutely mind-bogglingly intense. We don't have a word for it, mm. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, that tells you where we were. Those of us who were, uh, you know, ethnically cleansed and survived. We had, you know, my I know from my father's side, they they survived by the grit of their teeth. Right? I mean, they had to do whatever whatever needed to be done to make sure that their elderly mother had a roof over her head and and health insurance and and had access to healthcare. So, you know, these, these are histories that it takes time for us to write down. And when I talk to Kashmiris who grew up in Pakistan, in Kashmir, I, by force of that exile, I had to grow up. I was born in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. I did not have the, the blessing to grow up in Sirinagar, where my family was from. And uh, when I talk to people from Sirinagar, from Badgaon, from um, Islamabad, you know, and I tell them certain facts about our colonialism. 434 year long colonialism. Um, they're taken aback because they never learned, as Athar said, you know, it was never taught. It was never taught in the schools. It was never a part of the, of the discourse. You know, you, we, we scream about people being lynched in India for the suspicion of eating beef, right, Kamal? Mm -hmm. It raises a huge thing and, you know, sab yaad rakha jayega, sab kuch yaad rakha jayega, correct? Well, you know, in Kashmir under Dogra Rajas, there's a reason why the Vazvan, a very famous cuisine, does not have beef in it, because the punishment was capital punishment in, in, in both the Sikh regime as well as in the Dogra regime. And there were instances when entire families of 17 people, including three month old babies who couldn't have eaten meat. You know, I mean, we, they've not weaned off of mother's milk at that point, and they were uh, lynched for, uh, uh, for eating beef. Right. So these, we've been, we've been there. We know what it is like. And they actually um, skinned alive uh, the beef eaters. Pardon? There are pardon. That, that they were the, anyone who ate beef was yeah. uh, skinned alive. Was skinned alive. And Absolutely. Hung, hung, and hung skinned from alive, a lamp At major squ city squares. Yeah. This is Modi has not done the kind of things we have already faced, Kamel. Hmm. And those, you know, these Tariq Ali's. I mean, I'm. I, I Tariq Ali wrote this ridiculously stupid piece, um, you know, where he talks about, oh, it was Pakistanis, the tribal invasion. You know, I'm so sorry, this is an academic thing, but I want to say F him because he didn't know the history. 
you know, he doesn't know about the Kunchis who had suffered separately under the Dogra regime, massacres and genocides, and they were being stripped of their weapons. They had, they had been requisitioned, you know, they joined the British army, fought in the World War II, come back, uh, and they had weapons, their weapons were taken away which the Punchis correctly realized is the beginning of a genocide. That really was the beginning of the genocide. And at that point, they went to Peshawar, they got weapons from Peshawar mm -hmm. because they knew there was a genocide ongoing and it was, it was absolutely true. And Christopher Sneddon, Elias Chatta, people write about it. And Sneddon completely busts the myth about the, of the tribal invasion, which Indians, each and everyone knows by heart, and even the so-called secular leftist Pakistanis somehow have taken that false constructed history from Indian nationalists and taken it as vahi, as a revelation, and said, oh, here we have, we have something that you guys never knew. It was Pakistanis who were the villainous uh, in, in that discourse, and that's wrong in, in that the people who were coming into the Kashmir Valley more than 66% were people from Poonch who were trained because they had they joined the, uh, the British uh, uh, army in, in World War II. At least one sixth, so about 16 to 18% were Kashmiris from the valley who joined them. And there were the, 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 the Pathans, when they say the tribals, were also from Poonch and from the areas that were on the way to the valley of Kashmir because we have a very heterogeneous population. There are Pathans settled in the valley you know, with the last name Khan, there'll be, you know, uh, Akhar and uh, Hilal, you know, so many people with the Khan last name. And because we had an Afghan colonial uh, era as well. So there were lots of people who had settled in Kashmir way back then and their Patans and plus the adjacency, the Silk Route entail that our communication was actually never through India. It was always through uh, Baramula, through mm -hmm. Aptabad, through Murray, through Rawalpindi, through Lahore. There's a reason why there's a Kashmiri Bazaar and Wazwan available in, in Rawalpindi or in Lahore, um, because there were lots of us settled and not just through because of trade, but because of exile. You know, we all know about the, the Bengal famine, right? The horrendous pictures are shown uh, to everyone. Everyone in the globe has seen uh, mm -hmm. you know, little children with their ribs uh, poking out. How many of us know that about 40% of Kashmiri Muslims died from 1877 to 1879? Three years, 40% of Kashmiri Muslims died. So those of us, the, the three Kashmiris who are alive on this panel, it's, you know, it's, it's a miracle. It's a miracle because it shows that our ancestors were the lucky ones to, to survive that, mm -hmm. right? And because, but the Indian histor historiography never talks about it because the myth is always that the white people are the colonizers. It's the British who are the colonizers. So I really want to make an academic point here that I think POCO, post-colonial studies, really does us a disservice. It does not help us entangle and disentangle what Kashmir has been going through. Mm -hmm. What we, what I find in my work, the most useful to think along with to be in alliance with is actually indigenous studies. Mm -hmm. It's decolonial and indigenous studies against the onslaught of, you know, 400 years of colonialism and betrayal of treaties and settler colonialism. And, yeah. and you know, it's sovereignty over light and also um, our right to preserve our languages, our spiritual traditions, our culture which India with this ever since August 5th, it wants to completely, it's on steroid, the sector colonialism, and they want to do away, you know, another 50 years, who knows where they, whether they'll be people speaking Kashmiri or not. Mm -hmm. Who knows, we know what they do with mosques. We know what decisions they did with Babri mosque. You can destroy a mosque, that's a crime, but there's no criminal, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And not just that, but you can be allowed to make a temple on that particular stolen land and mark it with the foundation of a silver brick on the day that um, uh, Article 370 and 35A were abrogated, right? So India has always been a Brahminical colonial state. Yeah. And to even think of it as a vanguard of a, a post-colonial independent states, leftist states, non-allied states, that's bogus, right? And um, 
you know, Anderson has written about it in the ideology of India, how even this whole thing about claiming that Nehru uh, was a leader of the non-alliance movement, he was a very reluctant joiner at the end. And these histories really need to be known. Yeah. We need to bust those myths because there is an entire um, demography of upper caste Brahminical academics all over the world, including in India, who and Pakistani leftists seem to be so enthralled by them, who uh, who own, who who have the right, God-given right, because they're demigods, to to write our histories and write us out of it. They write us, our desires, our humanity out of those histories. Yeah. Right, and that's why I wrote that letter to uh, uh, Chatterjee, right, Partha Chatterjee. You know, where are you? You're writing this letter for Palestine. Fabulous. What about your sensitivities towards the colonialism where your position actually would enable to be effective? You are an Indian citizen. You teach at an Indian university. You are a you know, very well-known, famous person, right? Within India and in the rest of the world. Your positions would have a bearing on us. And after August 5th, I think in, in the month of September, he had a meeting, he had a, you know, there was a talk in Columbia University where he was giving the most bogus legal historical reason saying, oh, but that's exactly what happened to Hyderabad, so it's fine. I understand you guys as if we are pathologized crazy people, but this is the legal position. That's, that's rubbish. That's 2000% rubbish, right? And, and I think you guys, Kamel, you're young, you're right now finishing your PhD. You need to, you know, completely bust that power uh, there. Because it's, it's, it's a cult. It's a complete cult. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that you guys answered all, um, so many questions that I, I, was, I was thinking of. And so I think that it is really incredibly educational. And so thank you. I, 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 wanna, I wanna perhaps like um, end on one thing that I think is very troubling. Right, which is a subset of this lost history, is something very basic. You know, the loss, the the value of human life isn't even countable. Right, mm -hmm. we don't even have good statistical measures to really figure out how many people have been killed. Right, so it's interesting because in in, 20, in 2016, I remember I was, um, you know, I was writing the piece that I had contacted Hilal for, and I, you know, was using the source that said that since 1989, 70,000 um, uh, Kashmiris have been killed in the ins insurgency. Just before this panel, I opened an article from the Associated Press from last year, and it used that same statistic three years had elapsed since, since I had seen that last statistic and the same statistic was used even though 2018 had had the highest death toll since 2009, apparently. Now who knows, right? Like that, that information, informational aspect and the immense tragedy of, you know, the, the, the everyday life that is lost, that is so easily lost and so easily you know, forgotten because it's not counted, you know, um, that is such, a, is such a fundamental aspect of knowing anything about Kashmir. And I, and I want to understand, and, 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 you know, all of you can, can bear in on this, as to what really it is that prevents, you know, I mean, I think, of course, it's police narratives, it's the paramilitary forces narratives, it's the people who literally cannot count the people of the dead and are not allowed to, right? Um, what can really, how do we frame this? I mean, it just seems like a sad, tragic thing that is very hard to say anything about because it's so tragic, right? What do we, uh, how do we deal with that? Yeah. Many things. Uh... To begin with, uh, it's uh, uh, it obviously the repression. I'll give you an example like um, 
uh, in the newspaper called Greater Kashmir, where I worked until last July. Um, yeah, the, the newspaper actually should be credited with uh, uh, highlighting the issue of the disappeared people. So we used to have this um, one of the great Kashmiri journalists, uh, Zahir Adin. Mm -hmm. He actually would, uh, uh, he made like, he, he was the executive editor of the newspaper, but like a reporter, he went out to seek out the details of these people. And then he would profile these people in the newspaper. So if, if it is an issue at all this time, it's because of the coverage in the newspaper, I would say. Uh, and then uh, I remember uh, it must have been 2005 or six uh, for 21 consecutive days, uh, we published 21 profiles on page one uh, under a heading called Kashmir tragedy. And these were quite elaborate profiles of these uh, people like their lives, who these people were and also the, his idea of like, um, his idea behind these profiles was that they were not a mere statistic. So they were the people and how, how they were subjected to enforced uh, custodial disappearances. Um, and on the 22nd day, one of our editors got a call from the local army unit. Uh, saying that um, Salo, Tum Pakistani ho, ye kya laga hai, all such things. And then, uh, and then it stopped. It gradually, it's not that uh, the newspaper didn't publish uh, the profiles, but not in such a sustained manner, like which would create a campaign of sorts. Uh, uh, so, that's one thing that the state is omnipresent and it wouldn't let you. So why it's not ha happening. And then there were some institutions which were like um, the, 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 the dead count. It, it's, an, it's, it's one of the most important things uh, which has been, uh, but who will do it? Like you have, the newspaper is the, as they say, first, uh, uh, you can say the leaf in the history, but mm -hmm. uh, they, 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 they have their own pressures here. And you, it's a very uh, long story, the story of the local media. Um, basically they are ill-equipped and then they also have to, uh, they might not be even aware of the importance of such stories. Like that's also a very tragic thing. Uh, these institutions who could have done these things, they were never allowed to flourish here. Yeah. They were not mm -hmm. allowed to even take root um, in Kashmir. That's one thing. Um, uh, I think this, uh, when PDP first came to power in 2002, in the assembly, uh, one of their ministers uh, told uh, the members that um, I think uh, four and a half thousand people uh, mm -hmm. have been uh, are uh, are missing. He didn't use the word disappeared because that would be admitting the crime. Uh, uh, so he said that um, four thousand five hundred sixty people they have they are missing. And most of them have gone to uh, Pakistan for uh, arms training. So this is um, uh, how these things go uncontested also. Uh, uh, I'm uh, here, I'm reminded of um, a census, like which could have, uh, which could have become a precursor to, uh, you can say, one of the coherent databases uh, on Kashmir, at least on the number of dead disappeared, it was carried out by the uh, Jammu Kashmir Coalition of Civil Society. Mm -hmm. 
uh, for the Baramula district, one of the uh, 10 districts in Kashmir, like they actually tried to uh, trace out every person who had been killed or subjected to enforced disappearances. And if uh, I remember correctly, I think uh, in that district alone, I think more than 6,000 uh, people had died. Uh, but uh, JSK CCS can't carry out that uh, in a sustained manner because you remember uh, Khurram uh, in 2016, he was uh, arrested under uh, PSA, that preventive detention law for three months. So uh, these things can never be allowed to happen here. Like, to, um, Take uh, this uh, recent example of uh, three young men who were picked from their uh, accommodation and then murdered. Like it's a cold blooded murder. Um, and I think for the first time they have, been, uh, they have admitted that they were killed in a fake stage uh, gunfight. So, but so what? What do you make of that knowledge? One of my Friends, uh, uh, he told me that a uh, Palestinian told him that, uh, okay, you Kashmiris would reach, to, reach a level where uh, you would be able to enforce BDS and have the presence, the, the kind of presence the Palestinians have. The, even the United Nations would pass so many resolutions on against India, against settler colonialism, but that, that, <clears throat> which is, that, that, that this is the kind of reality we're faced with here. Three people were murdered and so what? Like then the governor goes to their home and says it will be investigated. Uh, and we have seen that how, what happened to such uh, investigations in the past. When you are operating with such impunity, it's 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 it's, uh, it's hopelessness. Yeah, and this, I I I feel like I don't want us to end on this feeling of hopelessness, but it also feels like there's legitimate cause, right, for us to really sit and think about what it means to be in the state of hopelessness and then try to try to educate people right through it because what one one thing that we can do i think and maybe it's sufficient maybe it's not who knows is try to actually get people who should be in solidarity with you knowing the facts mm -hmm. right um to be in solidarity with you with knowing the facts, you know what I mean? Um, that's why this is so important to us. So I would really just love, you know, I've, I've taken so much of your time. I would just love, you know, like a final word as to how, how it is that people can really be in solidarity, right? Is it, is, it's, it's just educationing, educational and educating ourselves with what is really happening in Kashmir and, you know, hearing you know people like you and activists in Kashmir etc um you know how how, do, how does that play out in your in your in your mind uh, see recently uh, one of the i think the most courageous journalists uh, around uh, anuradha basin mm -hmm. she's from jammu um, she was the one who actually filed a petition in the Indian Supreme Court against the uh, communications blockade last year. Uh, and who let her down? Her, the people from her own community, you can say the media fraternity themselves. Um, and now recently she wrote an article uh, where she said that you, the local media can't use fear as an excuse to not write anything. Yeah. It can't yeah. go forever. Like. And what followed was that uh, I don't know whether they, these two are interlinked, but there is a definite mm -hmm. connection. Uh, 
yeah. like um, her official residence it was ransacked by by a former legislator's brother uh, and uh, now uh, I, I have heard that uh, their office in Srinagar is also being closed down because it's uh, it's an it's an official uh, it's a government building uh, her newspaper has already been deprived of uh, government advertisements, which is the major source of uh, finance for the local press. Uh, what 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 this will essentially mean is that there are no platforms at all where you could articulate these things. I'm talking about the media. Like this is this by and large is this uh, situation um, is the state of all the institutions here. Uh, there are people uh, who want to write, but they have nowhere to write in. So um, many people like who uh, would want to love uh, write stories do not have platforms at all. The international press has limitations. They can take as many pitches as, like, which they find relevant, which have a global appeal. But there are issues which have a local um, resonance. Like, take for example, this mining rights. It needs to be written about again and again. Or the new this uh, new administrative formations in Kashmir. So these are very local issues, but with uh, immense uh, like ramifications. So, but they won't, they, they mean nothing for the international press. So how do, how do we uh, uh, address this, uh, this, these issues? It's not only about solidarities, like um, it's, it's more than that. Um, there are some fundamental uh, needs, like uh, the, the, the local media, it's like a basic need here in, in, a, in a, a region like Kashmir. Yeah. Uh, so maybe, but yeah, you are right that maybe external solidarities can address this issue. Uh, the, the International Federation of Journalists or the World Journalist Bodies, they have been raising these issues, but to no avail. Even the United uh, Nations uh, High Commissioner for uh, human, human Rights, they have like sent, I think, four communications to the Indian government since last year, since August 5. None of them has been answered. One was about the press, um, uh, about uh, how journalists have been booked under anti-terror law. No communication has been answered. Uh, yeah. Even, even the, there, there have been many Indians, like um, people like Gautam Naulakha, Sai Baba, and many other people who are who were whose solidarities were genuine that they were not um, unlike many Indian leftists. They they were, you could say their solidarity was pure. Uh, but you know what happened to them? Like they have they are in jail and um, many other people I have learned like many journalists who have been. Um, sacked from their jobs uh, uh, the, uh, and uh, for these media institutions like getting rid of such people who have been sympathetic to Kashmir the COVID uh, pandemic has been a, a blessing like you couldn't throw these people out otherwise but now they are citing financial reasons and uh, like uh, sacking them uh, yeah, uh, it's it's a, it's a it's a low point in Kashmir history, but uh, but it's also it can also be a turning point because uh, um, 
the Indian government has uh, left. Uh, I think uh, they they no they they don't leave any room for negotiation. So it's it's I think that they are not willing to negotiate it at all, uh, but bulldozing their way through Kashmir and uh, paving way for, uh, even even some uh, liberals have like dropped the mask and now take Karan Thapar, for example, he was <laughs> with Moet Pirzada, he was actually, I think, justifying uh, the demographic invasion. Well, let's see how it pans out. <laughs> so can I jump in? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I, I completely agree with Hilal uh, when he says that, you know, someone said to him that you'll be like the Palestinians. And that has been my worry as well. Not that I don't see it in the, I mean, worry in the sense that, uh, you know, you might have writers, you have the best writing, you might even have BDS, you will have the best scholars. Uh, the world will be on your side because your struggle is genuine. You will be the beacon of justice and, you know, for your land and for indigenous rights and all of that. But then you won't have land and that will be gone. You won't have your identity. You won't be the Kashmiri that you aspired to be at the dawn of what was to be the post-colonial uh, moment in the subcontinent. I completely see that danger. I, I am with you, Hilal, when you say this. And even in my own work, I, I'm like, okay, I'm doing all of this. What is it going to produce? And you, you know, who will I be by the time all of this is kind of, you know, I'm at the end and kind of looking back, where will all of this go? So that's one aspect of it. There is that danger that we might derive these little personal uh, satisfaction in thinking that we are critically nuancedly looking at Kashmir, trying to make the world understand. But on the other side, like what's the other option? Yeah. And I and Hilal will also agree with me that many of us, including him and all, you know our generation, basically our generation was kind of the first one after the one who had picked up the arms actively, they were the ones who started thinking about who are we? Why are we in this situation? Why is my father with this? Why isn't my father talking politics? Why? So all of those things, I, I think that that's our generation as well. We, we did decide to kind of understand this and make the world understand. And many of the uh, realities at that time when we began, we, we didn't know that at that time. I think when Huma and I started talking I would often kind of wonder about her history and which is why I kind of uh, nudged her. I said, no, you have to talk about this. List. She, she didn't talk about the entire thing, which is very powerful. One of the, one of the successes of the Indian government and I keep seeing in, saying Indian government, that's because that's the narrative that we have grown up with is invisibilization of the other side. The violence of language is so deep that even the militants who go to get who used to go get training in uh, Azad Kashmir would say that they're going border par when there is no border inside Kashmir. Yeah. So that's how deep the violence the, of language is. Mm -hmm. So fighting that, you know, it's like piercing whale after whale after whale. And one, we had to do that for ourselves. I I'm speaking for myself. There might have been more emancipated people who I probably didn't meet. And it's not as if Kashmiris were not writing. It's not as if Kashmiris were not understanding their history, but it was in a vernacular and they were not able to kind of uh, so sort of like maybe market their knowledge well. And also it was censored. They could hardly speak in the last 72 years in the same manner. And that's where when, when I use the word solidarity, I don't mean the just the activist solidarity. For me, it's a much broader word. It's an academic solidarity. It's a solidarity of knowledge. It's a solidarity of applied knowledge as well. And I think we are at that juncture uh, where we can kind of go the way where, that we have a lot of knowledge and we have a lot of people on our side, but then our land is gone because settler colonialism is on steroids. But I also think it's a moment uh, that, that, that is very creative and generative as well because the world does not belong to large democracies and large countries. It doesn't belong to them. I, I think there is many, many indigenous movements across the world 
Uma will bear me out in United States. You know, when I came to United States at first, I thought that I was coming to the land of brave, home of free or whatever. But steadily I realized that I was actually in Palestine and I was actually in someone else's nightmare where I was trying to kind of like find my knowledge, my subjugated knowledge, find the training for it. And now we are kind of thinking about decolonizing all of that. And that's what I try to do in my work. It's such a losing battle sometimes, but at the same time, I feel like most of the indigenous populations around the world, they're kind of rising, they're very strong. The indigenous movements here are very strong. And I do see there are changes occurring. And this conversation particularly, and the conversations that we've been increasingly having for the past five years, they kind of tell me personally to me that there is some geopolitical change happening in the future when that future is going to arrive, we don't know, but we have to be prepared for that. And I feel like we are all little cogs in that wheel. And I know Kashmir at this moment, it's not silent, it's been silenced. Mm-hmm. and. And we can feel that pain. We can feel that uh, despondency because we are not away from you. We are not, we, we are not isolated from that. We are living that with you. We might be in a more privileged position. We might be able to speak more, but we feel it. And the persecution is kind of like everywhere in, in different manners, different degrees. Uh, it's only in like you know it's only in a better place in a way that you have all the amenities taken care of. Uh, what happened today was like it's it's nothing uh, it's just a pointer uh, Huma was earlier talking about Burhan Wani and then we were talking about Facebook and I've written about this very recently when I was asked to buy a caravan one of the daily newspaper uh, one of the magazines in India about Facebook and Kashmir and social media I had posted something in May regarding Riaz Naiku who was the commander of Hezbollah Mujahideen who was martyred and I had posted about a news piece about him on Facebook. And then uh, someone, an Indian friend, he had posted, he had reposted. Turns out that his account was taken away. And I don't know what algorithm Facebook uses. Uh, They just kind of found out that I was the original reposter. Now I have been banned from doing several things. And in the past, they have taken my account and all of that, which are not super uh, problematic issues. They're not, then I'm not equating persecutions. But what I'm trying to say is how much important information is. India doesn't want any kind of genuine information to go to the rest of the world, because my belief is that at least 90% of population is good and wants to help you. And that's how, that's the solidarity, solidarities of knowledge making. That's, that's what I'm kind of talking about, uh, that people are craving information at this point. I'm getting called to different places where I didn't even think about Kashmir is going to be thought about in the same manner. They, they want to have a session on Kashmir. No, they should have a session on Kashmir. And I think that's very important. And also thinking about the other side, how, how the other side is so good at propagating their false propaganda and weaponizing Kashmiris uh, against each other, the issue of uh, Kashmiri Muslims and Kashmiri Pandits, how the other, P, uh, how India, the Hindutva India or the Congressy India has also en- energized those bases and weaponized people against you. So I feel at this moment, we do have to create that kind of uh, solidarities of knowledge making of applied applying knowledges and trying to use these international discourses and conversations to drum up that kind of uh, networks where we should be talking about Kashmir and talking about Kashmir in futuristic terms, Mm -hmm. which is that we have to decolonize this region. This region needs to be demilitarized. And then we have to implement uh, what the right right to self-determination entails. And your knowledge, your blood, your sweat should all go towards that. And whoever can do that. And I I do realize there are so many curtailments, such courageous journalists, such courageous writers, such skillful and such wonderful writers in Kashmir right now who can't write. And not just for the lack of platform, but lack of persecution as, I mean, because of persecution, they have been persecuted. For mere photographs, they are facing terror laws. So so it's, it's very hard for them. And at that time, the international community and the solidarities and diaspora, uh, they have to be energized because they have to stay uh, t- till that moment when the, 
the fuel is going to come back from the region. And hopefully that will happen. Uh, it's, the tyrannies don't last long. If I can... In, two, in 2010, uh, uh, Athar, you, you remember like how even some uh, Indian editors said that we should give Azadi to Kashmiris. Mm -hmm. like such was the, I think, uh, the force of the Kashmiri narrative and the, uh, the, the force of the Kashmiri resistance, like which was quite peaceful, which had been uh, brutally repressed. Uh, uh, but uh, what happened later? Like, uh, uh, so rather than thinking in terms of these cycles, like I see there's a palpable like intifada in Kashmir, mm -hmm. like which can erupt any at any time. But but where do we go from there? Because we had such intifadas in the past also. Mm -hmm. So why would these cycles break like? People, we know that it's uh, it, because of the repression. There is there is there is calm. It's not even calm. Like it's the silence of a conquered people. So, how to break out of these cycles? Like this is this has. If we go beyond like 1947, it has been centuries now. So, how to break out of this cycle? That is. That is uh, what worries us all, like uh, in this panel also. If I can now add mm -hmm. to the yeah. moment of despair and hopelessness or hope, mm -hmm. I would say that I completely, I, there are moments when I'm completely in line with um, Hilal's and others, utter despair. And there are, there are days when I can't breathe and I had to call the doctor. I can't breathe. Do I have COVID or is it my pain for Kashmir? Like seriously, I couldn't breathe. And you know, then you realize Fra Fano saying it in the 1950s about I can't breathe, colonialism makes me not breathe is really, a, uh, it's the truth. And yet I also want to, you know, Ilkak, you have two kids. Uh, Atar, you have two kids. I have two kids. Mine are older and I want to, I, I want to channel hope for them. I want to channel hope for Kamil. And I, you know, there's an indigenous poet who has a poem about, you know, the, our history has been written by the conquerors. Our history has been written by the settler colonial. However, who says the battle is over? Who says this is the final history that will survive? We are going to win and we are going to write our own thing. And I totally really believe from the core of my being that we will be free. We will be Azad. And I'm not just making it up. I just feel it. And I, I didn't have the pleasure of growing up in Kashmir, but I know that this is the calm before the storm. You know, for all of us, all of us have seen Battle of Algiers, right? After they had the Battle of Algiers won, the war is still not over. And after that, period of two to three years, remember, when he says, and then suddenly from the villages, from the rural areas, it was no longer um, censorable. It was no longer curtailable. It was no longer conquerable because the yearning for independence, for azadi, for, for our own land, for to, the, to determine our own futures is so intense. And that I want to find hope in because at this point there is a minuscule percentage, if any, within Kashmir, any Kashmiri around in the world who can afford to sit on the fence, mm -hmm. which prior to August 5th, there were deluded communities who would say, well, India is a secular country. Well, India has the, you know, blah, 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 fifth largest economy. And, you know, we're much better off with India. And then some, there's, there's none of that pretense is possible anymore all of our kids are walking repositories of our desires of freedom, our parents' desires for independence, our ancestral desire for dignity, for freedom, 
and um, I think we will be free. I'm, 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 you know, I'm sorry. I might, I might sound very naive, but I, I don't know whether in my lifetime, hopefully in my lifetime, I definitely want to see Kashmir being free. I, um, I don't think it sounds naive at all. I think it sounds necessary. I think we need, I think personally that we need the despair for the solidarity of knowledge making. Mm -hmm. um, and we need the hope for when, for moving through life, <laughs> you know. Solidarity. Um, Kamil, if I'm in, 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 allowed to, you know, ask a request, you yeah. are you're on Twitter, you follow me, you know, there, there's this allegedly progressive film festival that happens in the Bay Area every year around this point called Third Eye, Third Eye Film Festival. This year, they're showing one film allegedly on Kashmir, Road to Ladakh, by an Indian filmmaker with a solidly colonial gaze called Ashwin Kumar. And this film is being shown to highlight Irfan Khan's acting. And I and a couple of other Kashmiris were in touch with the programmer, with the founder of the film festival. And the guy ended up saying, you're too emotional. You're talking at me, you're not talking to me. And I was taken aback. I said, well, you know, actually I am emotional because we were ethnically cleansed. My aunt was raped, you know. Yes, I am emotional, but I'm actually talking about it as, as an intellectual, as an academic point. But I will be damned if I want to just cut off. I can't, I can't cut off my emotions from it. And so we do need solidarity. So I'm going to, I haven't yet written the letter, I'm going to write to uh, people who want to be in solidarity with us to boycott that effing film festival that is using a place with an ongoing settler colonial uh, colonial um, uh, uh, occupation that Genocide Watch has put us on alert and they dare to use our land as a blank canvas for uh, showing Irfan Khan's talents. Yeah. And in, because we said, you know, if you, even if you show this film, make sure you have a panel discussion. Mm -hmm. You know, make sure you have a couple of us to talk about colonial representations of Kashmir by Indian cinema. Why not, right? I mean, we're not, we're not the, you know, cancel culture, but we do have a right to ask for solidarity. Otherwise, don't call yourself progressive and radical and, you know, you know, you just, what's the difference between uh, Lenny Reifenstahl and, and Ashwin Kumar then? Mm -hmm. yeah. They end up justifying our genocide. That is a really <laughs> wonderful rallying cry, um, I think. I've given you something solid. Yeah, I think a really, really good rallying cry for us to, for us to end on. So I've taken so much of your time. We are such big admirers of your work and I am very excited for this panel to go up and for people to watch it and I, and I really, really do feel like people will be compelled to, to watch everything that you guys have to say. So thank you so much for, for being here.